Hi, and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Cross-Border Commerce and Enshift. Today, we're going to talk about next year, what will happen in the market, and how does that affect you as a retailer? And we that are hosting today's webinar are myself, Axel, and my colleague, Mats. We work as e-commerce evangelists at Enshift. We talk at trade shows, we write articles, we do podcasts, of course, help our customers, and today we're also doing a webinar. And as always, this webinar will be recorded and available online afterwards. And if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat and we will hopefully bring them up in the end. Yeah. Yep. So let's kick this off. If we have done this webinar the same time last year, it would have been much, much easier. We were coming out of the pandemic and e-commerce volume had been growing enormously. There was, of course, the question of how much of the shopping would remain with e-commerce and how much would shift back to physical retail. But overall, the outlook was very positive. During COVID, e-com had a tremendous boom with great sales and growth. Many special things, of course, happened during the pandemic, and they had a great impact on e-commerce and how customers wanted to shop. So the question back in 2021, it was more to understand how commerce had changed during the pandemic, how it would change again after the pandemic, and how to adapt. But just when we thought everything was going back to normal again, something happened. War, energy crisis, recession, very dark and troubling headlines. So, all old predictions for the future of ecom we can basically now throw out the window the world has changed so what will 2023 look like for ecom and what can we expect what major changes in customer behavior and income will impact the growth or decline for ecom in 2023 well what we know is that the world today is much more unsecure than it has been in many years it's really not looking good. But exactly how bad is it going to be? Well, nobody knows. We can all relate to this. Just 12 months ago, things looked good, but now everything is turned upside down. And you know, this is of course, not only about how our business are doing, this is also very personal. We now as consumers have less money to spend, and we're also continuously second-guessing everything that we spend our money on. The last couple of months, there's been a lot of talk of what to do, when and how. Should you be afraid of losing your job? Will you be able to pay bills and your mortgages? And there are many voices in social media and in the press that try to explain the current situation to you and give you tips and tricks. And we will today do the same. We'll try to give our take on what to expect in the coming year and what you can do to minimize the risk of losing too much business. So, what do Mats and I see coming in 2023 for ECOM? Well, we do see some clear trends in consumer behavior. And we'll also give you our take on how different players in ECOM should react to these trends. So what can we expect from customer behavior in 2023? Well, the first one is pretty obvious. When we have less money left after mortgages and utility bills, we have less money to spend. But it's not just that we will shop less, we will also shop differently. And why is that? Well, we can just buy less of everything. If we make one trip to the Canary Islands each year, it's not like we can now make 0.4 trips. And we can't buy like 75% of an expensive sweater. We will need to look for something else instead. And the next one is no surprise either. One aspect of shopping differently is that we now look for low price brands and low price stores. Maybe brands and stores that we have stayed away from earlier, but well, now we have no choice. And on the same note, we will also look more for second hand. Now, second hand was growing also before the recession from the shift towards sustainable shopping, but now it's driven more by cost savings. So, 
What else will consumers do? Now that we are more price sensitive, how do we shop? Well, we will actively search for the lowest price and not spend more money than we have to. And we will wait for stuff to go on sale. And speaking of going on sale, we will also think twice before buying those really expensive items. Do I really need an extra sono speaker in my bathroom? Well, not really. It would have to be at least, I would say, 40% discount before I would consider that now. Mm. But last year, I would have like, bought that speaker just to treat myself. Not anymore. And speaking of treating oneself, during the pandemic, we saw an increase in home deliveries. Yeah, part of it was because we want to stay away from all physical contact, but we also got used to the convenience. And it was worth paying a little extra for that convenience. But now we'll start to question if it's really worth it, if there's a free option to pick up at a parcel shop or in a parcel store, would I still pay extra for home delivery? Well, we think not. So what do these trends mean then for commerce? Well, of course, if consumers look more for low price, that is good news for the discount stores. But the question is how much of this swing is permanent? Once people have more money again, will they go back to paying more? Or have they realized that they are getting pretty much the same stuff at a lower price? Well, time will tell. We said before that consumers will actively search for the lowest price. This will, of course, increase the comparison sites such as Price Runner and Price Buy, and we will search for the lowest price across many retailers and set up triggers and alarms and notify us when something goes on sale. And now for maybe the most important but also least shocking statement of today. When we shop less in general, e-commerce will also take a hit. This is, of course, not rocket science. But what's more interesting, perhaps, is if e-commerce will decrease more or less than fiscal retail. Well, one thing that speaks to the advantage of e-commerce is the thing that we just mentioned, that it's much easier to compare prices online than it is in a fiscal store. So, Axel, but what is the advantage of fiscal retail in the recession? Well... When we think about discount shopping, we don't think primarily on going online. We think of jumping into our car, going to Pound Stretcher or B&M. And this, of course, also hurt e-commerce. And we also mentioned that consumers will stay away from those really, really expensive purchases. So what does this mean for commerce? Well, it means that if you only sell really high-end stuff, you are probably in danger. You need to find other product options in the mid and lower price range. Okay, uh, to summarize what we have talked about up until now. We talked about consumer will shop less and look for low priced items. And the willingness to pay for premium delivery is going to be lower. It sure is. Uh, also, one thing that we have talked about the last couple of years is uh, if we in the industry should stop talking about e-commerce. With the rise of terms like omnichannel retailers, unified commerce and channel agnostic consumers, isn't everything just commerce now? Well, me and Axel, we beg to differ. The consumer of today is, is often described as channel agnostic, where it doesn't matter if you are shopping online or in a store, it doesn't matter if you're at a website or in social media. You might explore something online and then buy it in a store, or you might explore something in a store and then buy it online. Everything is just commerce, unified commerce. Well, that might be true from the consumer point of view. But let's face it, there's still a huge difference if you're a pure player only selling online, or if you're an omnichannel retailer with physical stores. And we will now try to give you some concrete tips on how both pure players and omni players should think. So let's look at omni first, I think. Yeah. Well, the obvious difference between pure players and omni players is that omni players have physical stores. So, how can you use these stores to maximum advantage? We'll look at a number of concepts here. The first concept is what is called buy online, pick up in store, also known as BUPIS. So why is this a good concept? Well, it's sometimes labeled as convenient delivery option for the consumer. 
But we all know the main thing is to get the consumer into the store to do some upselling. And this is really an effective strategy. Just look at these numbers. 49% uh, buy something extra when they pick up their parcel. And even if your numbers only would be like 10%, it's still really, really good. And also, maybe you could do a little extra to get the customer into the store. Why not send out a special offer where you say in a text message, come and pick up your parcel before 5 p.m. today and get a free pair of socks. If you sell clothes, that is, otherwise it could be weird. Yeah. Or not, people always need extra pair of socks. But uh, boopies is also important for returns. Returning stuff in a store makes return handling cheaper for the retailer and easy for the consumer not having to worry about packaging and printing a label, etc., etc. And once again, getting the customer into the store is always a good thing. Yeah. So what else can you do with your stores? Uh, well, now that speedy delivery is becoming more and more important, you can use your stores as micro fulfillment centers where because your stores will probably be a lot closer to your customers than your central warehouse is. And this is a concept called ship from store. But it's not that easy to do it. Uh, I mean, you need to have a process that really fits smoothly into the store's daily operations because uh, the people working in the store, they're of course busy with customers and everything, and, and you can't have them interrupted by handling online orders all the time. So you need to make sure that you can do, do both. Um, and also to really fulfill those very tight delivery promises that you give your customers, you need to have relationships with very good last mile carriers. And, but if you can make it, what are the advantages of using ship from store? Well, on-demand delivery. Uh, this is also known as quick commerce, getting orders out to consumers maybe in under two hours. Reducing your shipping cost. Uh, of course, costs are naturally reduced as carriers are delivering locally. And some green logistics also, by replacing the emissions from dozens of shoppers driving to a store. So, ship from store gets your stuff to the consumer quicker, cheaper, and more sustainable. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, and also keep in mind, for this upcoming Christmas shopping, there's, there's also a question on how close to Christmas you can continue to sell stuff online and still promise delivery before Christmas. Uh, but if you do ship from store, you could probably continue to sell online maybe one or two days extra because you know that the delivery is so quick. And that could be a lot of money for you. So... For the only player, it might be true that it doesn't matter which channel the customer uses. Customers expect and they should also get the same service regardless of channel. And also many only players, they have gotten really, really good at this. So maybe there is such a thing called unified commerce after all. But commerce is actually much more than commerce. If you enter a store, you clearly don't have the same delivery options as you do online. What we see in this picture is typically the only choice you have, carrying it home yourself. But why isn't there such a thing as unified delivery? Why can't we have the same delivery options from a store that we have online? Yeah, what if I find something in a store that I, I want to have it, but I don't want to carry the packages around all day? Might be planning to go to a concert or, or go to an after work with friends. Wouldn't it be better for me to buy it in store and then get a home deliver next day? Because I mean, if there is something called buy now, pay later, which is getting really popular, why shouldn't there be a buy now, deliver later option in a store? Well, remember we heard the term BNDL first. It's going to be huge. And it was right here today. <laughs> so we talked about Omni, but what about the pure players? What should they do? So what is the difference between a pure player and Omni player? Well, of course, one main advantage about being a pure player is that you only have one storefront to worry about. That's your own website. That's also the drawback because uh, your site, it better be really, really good. It needs to be fast, it needs to be easy to navigate, and it needs to be crystal clear. So how do you attract your customers to your website and how do you get them to complete the purchase? We are now talking about what is known as conversion. And the first thing you need to know, understand and know about conversion is that conversion is not only about conversion. Uh, it's it's complicated, I know, but we'll try to explain. Mats? Yeah, and uh, to my help, I have this uh, beautiful layered cake here. Uh, and this will illustrate everything. 
So typically, when we look at conversion, we tend to look only at the actual conversion rate, that is, uh, how many uh, complete a purchase on your website. But you also need to understand that there are so many different layers and levels of customer interest at your website. So let's say that the top layer of this beautiful cake is your conversion rate. As you can see, there are many, many more uh, layers below this. Some customers might leave your site directly. Some may scroll around a bit. Some may actually look at one of your products and some may even put one of your products in the shopping cart. And your job is to identify all these different stages and remove hurdles that might deter people from taking the next step. And if you can get like 5% more customers to put something in the cart, that will eventually pay off also in conversion. And giving clear and relevant information at all stages is of course an important step. The customer shouldn't need to search for the answers. And given that we said earlier about willingness to pay for shipping, it's important we think that you'd offer at least one free shipping option and free boopies does not count. Yeah, I mean, of course you can have the free um, buy online pick up in store uh, and, and that's not really a, it's a delivery option. It might not be a shipping option. Yeah, so one yeah. free shipping option. So, but uh, going back to stores, if you're a pure player, uh, does not mean that you can't have any stores? Uh, well, of course, it's a lot of um, huge investment to invest in a physical uh, chain of stores, uh, and not you do it overnight. But even if you can't do that, you can always uh, do a pop-up store. And doing a pop-up store, as we see in this Adidas example, it's uh, it's not uh, so much for doing buy online, pick up in store or, or ship from store, but this is a great way to get a showroom for your products because some products, they do tend to sell more if they are experienced live but before they are bought. And uh, regardless if you're a pure player or an omni player, you need to give your customers a premium delivery experience. And we know this is not news for 2023, but I think it's worth repeating. Yeah, I mean, we've been talking about delivery experience for uh, non-stop for the last like five, seven years. Uh, and what do we mean by delivery experience? Well, delivery experience, it's all those things involved in giving your customer a premium delivery. It's about providing several relevant delivery options at checkout. Do I want to pick up my parcel or do I want to have it delivered to my home? At what time? What carrier do I prefer? Can I also get a green delivery option? And how quickly can you pick and pack the customer orders? I would say there's zero tolerance anymore for stuff not leaving the warehouse the same day. Yeah, and this is typically something you see if you look at maybe Omni players who have come from just doing physical retail and then going in, into also selling online, you know that they typically have a, a logistics process that, that's sort of optimized for doing uh, to, to uh, restock the stores. And that's not the same process as, as doing uh, online. So you can see that everything is really, really slow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you also need to look at your returns. You need to have fair returns policy and, and a good returns process. And, and what do we mean by fair? Well, it should really be easy to return, uh, but it doesn't have to be free as, as long as uh, consumers sort of perceive it to be fair. Yeah, and make sure not stop communicating with the customers after the purchase. The customer wants to know all new things all the time at what's happening to the parcel. So don't waste time and money by having to answer phone calls from people asking, where's my parcel? Yeah. Uh, and also, you should make use of the fact that uh, your customers, they are in buying mode when they have bought something from you. So may, what if you would tell your customer in a, in a, in a message, well, uh, thank you, valid customer. Thank you for your order. We'll start packing this in 30 minutes. Uh, if you add one extra item now, you can get that for 20% less. So it's time for a quick summary also. Uh, we have talked about how the recession is affecting e-commerce and uh, we think it's not looking that good. And we also talked about how you need to use your strengths to your advantage. 
If you're an Omni player, you need to make sure that you use your physical stores to their fullest potential. Well, both buy online, pick from a store, and ship from a store. And also, you might want to pick up on this concept that we introduced um, buy now, deliver later. Yep. And uh, also use your stores, of course, for doing simplified returns. And if you are a pure player, you need to make sure your website is absolutely top notch and that you understand all about the different aspects of the conversion that Matt's told about the layers of the cake and that conversion is not only about conversion. So uh, please scan this QR code to get access to our knowledge hub where we have our popular e-commerce blog where we visit different warehouse and e-commerce companies and personalities. We do uh, all most uh, other webinars there and so on mm -hmm. and much stuff about e-com. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see now. I was, uh, we had some in questions from the chat from, from someone arriving late uh, and asking if this would be available uh, online after, and it will. Uh, do we have any questions more from um, the chat? Or um, maybe I can ask you a question, Matt, instead. You can try. Yeah. Um, let's see. Should we talk about maybe? Let's pretend I'm a retailer. Uh, I don't have fiscal stores. How should I think about returns? Free or do I charge? Yeah, that's the. That's a good question. Uh, I think in terms, I think that this sort of the debate on returns has been a little bit misguided um, the, the last couple of years that that everyone has talked about about returns as being some something really really bad and evil, and of course there is a cost associated uh, with handling returns. And, and of course, uh, you should really you don't want to have too many returns, but also, but it's, but it's part of doing business. I mean, having customer services or having a, a uh, having a physical location, everything costs money, but it's just part of, of doing business. So, so the, the important stuff is you shouldn't make it too complex to do return. Uh, you could charge for doing return. I mean, that's not uh, I think the issue as long as it's relatively hassle free that you don't. Um, maybe printing return label is a hassle because no one has any printers anymore. I mean, your printer is something stored away in, in, in a closet somewhere and, and the, the, the ink is old and you can't use it. So, so if you give the, the customers the ability to do a, a digital return or, or um, something like that, I mean, that uh, if you don't have a fair returns policy, people will, will not uh, shop from you because, I mean, uh, let's face it, doing e-commerce and you don't can actually feel the product, uh, it is a risk. So, so uh, I mean, use returns to your advantage instead. And of course, there are uh, many retailers, uh, who, if, if you can handle returns well, and you can also get uh, maybe people to, 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 to uh, replace it with something else from your store. Yeah, okay, uh, long and good explanation. Thank you. Um, but okay, uh, we see we don't have any more questions. Uh, Let's see now. Do you got something here? Do you see? Do you see anything coming in 2023 that will be unexpected and that we have not seen before? Do we have something? Do we expect something that's unexpected? <laughs> um, uh, we have talked about in earlier uh, webinars also, and uh, maybe on how uh, last mile carriers will start to consolidate. We saw it actually in Sweden a couple of months ago here. And I think that it's gonna be tough for e-com, but it's also gonna be tough for, uh, for carry companies also. I think we're gonna see more consolidation there. It's gonna to be tougher for everyone. So I think more, also more collaboration maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I think, I think so. Because if you look at the, the uh, many of, of these new market entrants in terms of, of last month delivery, the, uh, and also of course many e-commerce players are, are driven by, by venture capital. Uh, and of course with the recession, we, we see venture capitalists uh, looking more at how can quick can, can attain profitability. Uh, and, and so look more towards profitability and less towards just gaining market share quickly. And I think this will force many uh, many players, both uh, retailers and, and carriers, uh, to to consolidate uh, with each other and, and just try to see what kind of sort of economies of scale can can we attain and, and uh, try to do maybe less yourself. 
Uh, we got a question here from Toby. Uh, hi, we, uh, where is the progress towards default driver to deliver? Uh, default deliver to Pudu and the search chart for deliver to home. Well, um, I think um, it really is, is, is a matter of of, uh, of cost and sort of reflecting cost. Uh, and I think also related to what we said that that we need to look at sort of profitability for the carriers as well. I mean, a Pudu delivery is cheaper to produce for the carrier because you have more, more packages being handled at the same time going to, to a, a common point, uh, whereas the home delivery is a little bit more, more, uh, more expensive. And I think when you need to be more profitable, you would probably try to, 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 to uh, reflect that in the pricing towards the, uh, the retailer. And then the question is what, uh, I mean, retailers that are struggling with profitability do they sort of uh, put that cost on, on the consumer or they do they try to do to swallow it uh, themselves but i think it's what we see uh, interestingly is is uh, everything is of course about psychology because if you look at uh if you have one uh, delivery option uh, to to a pudo uh, which is free and then you ha have uh, a, a surcharge for for a home delivery then people really tend to uh, not deviate from from the free delivery options because it's very it feels painful to 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 not choose the free one. If you do, however, charge a little bit for for the pudo delivery, then um, you have probably more people sort of uh, opting for for the more expensive home delivery instead because they, they can see the value. Because as long as you're paying something, then paying a little bit more is less painful than going from what's perceived as free. Of course, there's no such thing as a free delivery in reality, but it perceived as free, and that is, it's it's painful to start paying. And also, we saw that even uh, if we charge a little bit for the Pudo, people are even uh, willing to pay more for home delivery than they were before. So, if uh, yeah, charging for the delivery is a good thing, we think. Yeah, but also as I said previously, is that that if you start, I mean, perceiving uh, home delivery as as sort of unnecessary, sort of uh, that we don't want want to treat ourselves to, then that 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 could hurt the the, the home delivery business. On the other hand. Uh, when we see sort of competition becoming more and more fierce be between uh, online retailers, then offering and, and people have gotten used to, to a certain level of service, then of course uh, it's difficult for, for, for the retailer to sort of strip away or charge too much for the, these options that, that consumers have gotten used to. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we're running out of uh, time. Thank you everyone for joining and uh, scan the QR code and follow me and Mats on LinkedIn and ask questions directly to us there if you want more info or anything. And uh, this will be shared later by CBC Commerce. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you.